muchas gracias a todos por venir y muchas gracias porque esto es casi bueno, un conclave, no digo que secreto, pero discreto. Porque vamos a tocar temas que no son los más populares y los que más ayudan a un político a hacer una buena carrera. Pero bueno, esto es así. Bien. Uh, comprender la violencia humana es difícil debido a muchos factores implicados ya que no todos se encuentran exactamente bajo nuestro control estos factores abarcan del entorno familiar al social e incluso al legal pero también pasa por rasgos de personalidad individual predisposiciones genéticas y el concurso de elementos biológicos como hormonas, neuropéptidos y tú ya te vas a explayar aquí asociados con conductas antisociales se trata de un problema que requiere un análisis multidisciplinar, en el que tomen parte no solo políticos, y donde la evidencia científica ocupe un lugar central. Hace pocos días, con ocasión del evento Standing Up for Science, que se llevó a cabo en este Parlamento, bueno, pues ya, ya esto ya insistí en que la ciencia tiene que eh, jugar un mayor papel en la política, es indispensable. Por eso me alegro de que la ciencia sea hoy la protagonista, porque justo nos acompañan tres estudiosos europeos, aquí siempre lo hacemos todo europeo, de temas sobre agresión humana. Hoy estamos más sensibilizados que hace décadas con la violencia familiar y de pareja, pero esto no significa que haya más. Steven Pinker refiere que en Estados Unidos la íntima contra las mujeres ha disminuido en casi dos tercios desde los años 90, mientras que el índice de asesinados por sus parejas, tanto víctimas femeninas como masculinas, sigue disminuyendo desde los años 70. Eso lo tenemos que tener en cuenta. Tampoco significa que el problema sea poco importante, cuidado. ¿Eh? La violencia familiar y de pareja sigue siendo un problema global necesitado de explicaciones y de soluciones. Según la OMS, una de cada mujer experimenta alguna clase de violencia íntima o de violencia sexual a lo largo de sus vidas. Los hombres, sin embargo, están lejos de ser inmunes a ese tipo de violencia, como muestran literalmente cientos de estudios a lo largo de décadas. He aquí un punto importante para entender la violencia íntima y familiar. Los hombres y los niños también son víctimas. Este hecho sigue siendo políticamente difícil de digerir. Me atrevo a decir que por dos razones fundamentales. En primer lugar, como subraya también uno de nuestros ponentes, Joaquín Suárez, la atención por las víctimas masculinas sigue percibiéndose como si se robara recursos morales y económicos destinados a las víctimas femeninas. Una especie de desafortunado uh, argumento de suma cero. La segunda razón es menos ideológica, pero más profunda y psicológica. Simplemente las sociedades humanas tienden a ser menos sensibles al sufrimiento masculino. La psicóloga social Tania Reynolds documenta que este sesgo, favoreciendo a las mujeres, persiste a través de las culturas y llega a la conclusión no tan sorprendente de que la gente apoya más fuertemente las políticas que benefician a las mujeres. Me preocupa que este sesgo esté afectando incluso a los niños y los adolescentes, grandes olvidados, y aquí en el Parlamento bastante, en temas como la violencia familiar y sexual, donde sabemos que están afectados de forma nada trivial. Nuestra invitada, Nicola Graham Kevan, nos aportará a buen seguro datos sobre esto. El evento de hoy representa la culminación de un largo trabajo precedido por una pregunta parlamentaria que hicimos hace unos meses sobre violencia familiar y víctimas masculinas dirigida a la Comisión Europea. Nuestra intención es, ante todo, presentar la evidencia científica que, a nuestro entender, debería orientar el debate social, legal y político. Para ello presentamos un nuevo estudio que aborda la violencia familiar y de pareja de una forma inclusiva, documentando los patrones de género en agresión a lo largo de las distintas regiones mundiales, elaborando razones para intentar explicar el persistente rechazo de la evidencia y finalmente sugiriendo algunas recomendaciones. Ese estudio ha sido elaborado por Joaquín Suárez, profesor emérito de la Universidad Mid Sweden, que ya había participado en un proyecto sobre violencia familiar en Europa financiado por la Comisión Europea, por Nicola Rajengigen, Kivan, experta en psicología de la agresión de la Universidad de Central Lancashire, y por dos autores más, Orian Sundin, también de la Universidad de Mid Sweden, y Gloria Macasa, de la Universidad de Gabla, que no están aquí. 
Además, tenemos la suerte de contar con una joven investigadora española, Marta Iglesias Julios, estudiante de doctorado en el programa de neurociencia Champalimot y una activa divulgadora científica, ¿eh? en Twitter, en todas partes, muy presente. Uh, fue la primera autora española en publicar un artículo en la revista Quilet, una revista mm, especialmente en contracorriente y con un título significativo, Why Feminists Must Understand Evolution. Y cuenta ya con un libro en su haber, Nuestra herencia animal, la importancia de la historia evolutiva en el comportamiento, que lo editó el país hace unas semanas, que nadie encuentra y yo tampoco he podido encontrar, pero en fin, estamos en ello. Sí. Marta nos hablará de la agresión femenina desde la evolución, una introducción magnífica al tema que nos trae hoy aquí. Quisiera mostrar a todos los invitados mi más sentido agradecimiento y el de mi equipo por su gran trabajo. En el caso de Nicola es ya la segunda colaboración y por supuesto extiendo la bienvenida pues, a todos ustedes que nos visitan hoy y porque no cabe duda de que ya han venido porque tienen un interés sincero. Espero que haya más oportunidades para seguir trabajando en este tema tan, tan controvertido que afecta tanto a nuestro bienestar y seguridad y también en de, bueno, pues a, a la gente que queremos, nuestros padres, nuestros hijos, hermanos, amigos, conciudadanos. Pues ahora vamos a dar la palabra y el primero que nos va a hablar va a ser Joaquín. Adelante, Joaquín. Thank you very much. Thank for the invitation, the opportunity. Ah. Do I need a microphone? Yes, yes, you, you do. Yes. Okay, thank you for the invitation uh, and for the opportunity to talk about the subject that uh, it, it is very near my heart. Uh, in, in a sense, it's amazing, but tragic. Here you have hundreds of thousands, if, of, if not millions of women and men who are abused almost on a daily basis, and sometimes severely, but you only hear talking about uh, 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 violence against women. Even more tragic is to think that you can solve the problem of violence against women without taking into account the violence against men. They go together. It's like, uh, it's like a coin. It has two sides. And somehow we have arrived at what we are only looking at one side. So I, I decided, uh, together with, with uh, my colleagues and in collaboration with, with your group, to talk about violence against men, but in a different way. Because usually they talk either about women or about men. And I have chosen studies only studies with both women and men. So I will present data about that from different continents, from Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, and uh, uh, English-speaking industrialized countries. Okay. Uh, what is intimate, intimate partner? Intimate partner is a person with whom one has a, a, a relationship. It could be a boyfriend, a spouse, a husband, a wife. Uh, and I've decided to focus on physical intimate partner violence. Because in the beginning I want to talk about physical, uh, psychological, sexual and consequences. And I say, my God, it's impossible to do this kind of work. So I focus today on physical intimate partner violence. Uh, physical vi violence is when you have the intention uh, to use physical vi violence, uh, which has the potential to ca cause death, disability, injury. Uh, the situation today is like that. Most research and funding goes to study violence against women and, and the consequences. It's very difficult to get funding to, to study uh, men or to study uh, both at the same time. Organizations like the WHO involved in, in, in domestic violence, they concentrate almost 100% on, 
on women as victims and men as perpetrators, which I found very strange, uh, and I don't know why. I have an idea why, but it's a bit controversial. Most prevention, treatment, and sheltering strategies are related to women. Uh, uh, are, I don't know if in Spain there is, or, or in France there is shelters for men, or, or I don't know. There, there are very few shelters for men. Uh, prevention is always about violence against women, and the same thing is treatment. The policies, the regulations, that, and the laws are all oriented towards women. I would call them sexist. I know only one country in Europe, and perhaps in the world, that have a natural uh, uh, domestic violence law. It's Portugal. Mm -hmm. uh, taking an example of Spain, Spain is an extreme. Uh, the laws in, in, in Spain are extreme. I, it's, it's unbelievable. And another problem is that every time you talk about violence against men or women, they rise the patriarch patriarchal society. Because we live in a patriarchal society, men use violence to dominate women. But, my God, I, I, I cannot find support for that. And uh, Nicola, she knows the subject very well about that. Yet, we have hundreds of studies, and I mean three, four, five hundred studies, that without doubt, uh, show that violence is not what people think it is. And, and, and uh, if you look at media, most of the times, if there is some case of violence, they only present extreme ca cases of women who are victimized and men always as a perpetrator. So what I have done... <clears throat> Now, what are the obstacles to put forward the violence against men? It's ideological. I, there is a part that is ideological. I, I'm sorry to say, but there is, uh, especially in the, um, in the, in the, femini in the new feminism, uh, they, they, they put forward this idea that domestic violence is an activity of men that men use to dominate the woman. Another way why they don't put the, uh, uh, the violence against men forward is that they conceal the, uh, the evidence. That is, they have studied both men and women, but only present that about women. The media is another actor in this. The media likes to present cases of female victimization more than male, special, very extreme cases. Uh, I, I think part of this, why people don't talk, or, or, or the WHO, the Union European, don't, don't bother so much about, about uh, violence against men, I think, personally, is to def defend feminism. Because we live in a patriarchal system, and because violence, because men abuse women to dominate and control a woman, if we start to talk about that, it will be problematic for the patri patriarchy as the causes of, of, of violence. But violence, like, like you said, is a very complex thing, social, biological, but they don't talk about this. And they are also afraid that if we talk about violence against men, somehow we take money from, uh, which is used for, for, for treating or, or sheltering or preventing violence against them. I think it's, 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 it's a, an absurd idea, really, because they, they go together. So what I have done, I have, I have looked as... as best I could 
on data concerning the occurrence, occurrence of physical uh, uh, violence using only studies with women and men. Uh, and the data concern university students, middle school students, clinical cases, general population and community, community, community samples. The data is from Africa, Asia and the Pacific, Europe and the Caucasus, Latin America and the Caribbean, the Middle East and industrialized speaking nations like Australia, Canada, New Zealand, UK and United States. So here is Africa. I, I look at uh, 28 studies from 18 countries, you can see, and the number of subjects in these studies were 71,812, uh, and uh, the number of women were 34,087 uh, women. It were uh, university students, other students, adolescents, clinical, population, general population, community samples. When I put the pooled frequency, when I put together the frequency, I found when it comes to victimization in Africa, 15.8% of the women are victimized and 35% of the men are victimized. It's a bit, it's, it's a different, but the difference is not so big. So we can say we are looking about some kind of symmetry. Of course, the range differs. The range is very, very large. You have uh, 2%, 60%, 50%. But now, when I put together, I come to, to, this, uh, to these numbers. It's possible that there are more studies, but uh, I, I didn't find it. It took a lot of time. And then I look also in Africa concerning perpetration. And remarkably, I only fi found eight studies from three countries. And I wonder why don't they look at perpetration? And the number of subjects were uh, 23,298. Most of them were women. Again, students, uh, clinical population, general population, community samples. The results show that 19.7% of women, they are the abusers. They abuse men. And 25.1% of men abuse women. So, once again, the, the numbers are not so different. And it's quite interesting because many people uh, have this idea that in Africa everyone is beating each other and, and, and that the abuse of women is very high, etc. But it's more or less the same. Then I go to Asia. There I found 15 studies from nine countries. Again, the same population, I don't need to repeat. You can see the number of people, uh, it's about 24%, uh, 24,000. Here, what we found is that, uh, uh, the, it's that, again, the same thing. Uh, a bit, 29.9% of the victimization was against women. And here is a bit more against men, 21%. Uh, 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 nat naturally, the range is, is very, very high. So it's not big. It's, it's almost like Africa, although a bit on the, on the other side. In, in Asia, I found 18 studies from uh, 12 countries concerning perpetration with uh, almost 27%, 27,000 women. Uh, here, women were more abusive than men. 21.3% of women abused men, and 16.8% 16 were men who abused the women. 
So there is some difference uh, between Africa and Asia, but not that much. Once again, the numbers are more or less the same. Then I look at uh, Europe and I found 15 studies from nine countries, some from Spain. I think I found four studies from Spain or five studies, I don't remember exactly, where, uh, interestingly enough, there was more victimization from whom, from more victimization against men than against women. Uh, and uh, the population is about the same. Uh, and 80% uh, of women were victimized and 17% seven, 7 of men. So it, again, it's 1% here, 1% there, 2%. And these, uh, uh, these studies in Spain are quite interesting because they are very large. Most of them are students, but they are very large. And that is clear that uh, there is more violence against men than against women. <clears throat> And then they did the same uh, concern interpretation. There I found 26 studies from 15 countries, and the population was about 22,000. And uh, here the women were more, have a tendency to abuse men more often than the opposite. 23% uh, of women abused men, and 21.2% of men abused women. So once again, we can see symmetry. I go very quickly. And then I look at Latin America. Uh, people have this idea of Latin America where is there a lot of abuse of women and, uh, 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 and that men are uh, 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 the perpetrators. So I found 13 studies from nine countries. Barbados, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Granada, Jamaica, Mexico, Trinidad, Tobago, and Venezuela. And here you see something quite interesting, is that men are more victimized than women. It's almost a difference of 5%. And we are talking about uh, uh, university students, adolescent, clinical, general population, and community samples. This is victimization. And when it comes to uh, perpetration, I found 11 studies from seven countries. And here is perhaps the biggest difference of all the, uh, the countries. Here are women more, they tend to abuse men uh, more often than men. 33.8, almost 34% 30, of women abuse men, and 25 24% of men abuse uh, women. It's quite interesting. Yes. The Middle East, it's a problem because uh, it's very difficult to do studies in the Middle East where you ask both men and women. So I found only four studies. One from Israel, uh, from Israel Pakistan, Tunisia, and Turkey. And the Middle East is a bit different because there I can see there is more violence against women than against men. But I had only found four studies, so it's very difficult to have an idea how it is in the Middle East. The perpetration here is also differs from, from, uh, from uh, the other regions. Here is more perpetration from men to women than the opposite. But you see the numbers are very high. But I found only two studies, one from Israel and one from Iran. So here I cannot say that the situation is, is, is better or worse than in other countries. And then I look at uh, English-speaking countries, and is there where you found most of the, the studies. I found 78 studies from five countries, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, <coughs> UK, and USA. And here, in these countries, uh, men are more victimized than women. It's not a big difference, but still, it's about 2%. Uh, the populations are quite the same, uh, uh, but of course the range is very, very broad. And I found the same thing 
about perpetration. Women in these countries uh, tend, tend to be more, uh, more violent than men. So, my conclusion is that I looked at 153 studies concerning victimization for, from four, 54 countries, six regions, with almost half a million people. We are talking about half a million people, we are not talking about thousands. And if you look, the rate of victimization was slightly higher among men, among men than women. It's bad. It was uh, a bit uh, wrong there. But varied very highly. And you have the numbers from each, we, uh, from each region when concerns women and men. And when I look at the final uh, numbers, you will see that it was a bit more uh, victimization against men than against women. When I come to perpetration, uh, we have the op opposite side. We have 151 su studies, 44 countries, six regions, and again, almost half a million people. And uh, uh, if you look at the perpetration total, it was a bit more perpetration from women to men than the opposite. So my conclusion is that uh, the, the present review I think it adds evidence to the symmetry of abuse. Improvements have happened, but yet IPV against men are still not giving the attention that it deserves. Not much attention has been paid to abuse of men at the national and international levels, policy makers, social health care, health care planners and providers, official and non-official organizations work with violence, uh, funding providers, the media and the public. Uh, it's, it's urgent to modify, it's really urgent to modify prevention and treatment approaches to include victimized men and to accept that there is symmetry in physical violence. Also important is the modification of policies, regulations, and laws about EPV by including men as victims and accept the symmetry of physical uh, EPV. Organizations such as uh, United Nations and European Union how to change their approach to EPV and funding. It's almost impossible to get funding here. Uh, uh, yeah, and it's also important to, uh, to involve the media because the media is, is very important to spread out the, the information to the public. The public don't know about this. The, the only message they, they hear is that women are victims and men are perpetrators. And I believe to solve this terrible problem, we need both. Uh, we are not helping the woman because we forgot the other part. Thank you for listening to me. Ahora vamos a pasar a la intervención de Nicola Graham Kivan, que nos va a hablar también sobre agresión contra los hombres. Adelante. Okay, well, we're finding my slides. Thank you for having me. So it's nice to get out of England for a little bit of time. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the impact of witnessing domestic violence on children. I can talk about coercive control in the questions if anyone's interested, because I've done quite a lot of work on that. Um, but we thought the impact on children was quite an important topic to discuss. I'm just going for the slides. <laughs> I don't know. It disappeared. I sort of remember the first slide, so I'll start. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk very briefly about adverse childhood experiences. I don't know how 
interested people are in that in Europe. It's certainly a really growing concern in England, and certainly the World Health Organization and the European Union have work published around the importance of reducing adverse childhood experiences. So I'm going to talk briefly about that. Uh, then we're going to talk about prevalence of exposure for boys and girls to the parental violence between parents. Um, then we're going to talk about what are the outcomes for children who have been exposed to this in childhood, adulthood, a little bit about protective factors, and then a brief slide on implications. So if anyone's looked at the adverse childhood experiences uh, work and you've gone online, you can do your ACE test. So what you do is you look at these questions and you give yourself one answer for each question you say, yes, that happened to me. Uh, and then you can look at lots of graphs and see what the outcomes are for people who have a similar profile to you. But within here, one item two, did your parents ever experience being pushed, grabbed, slapped, or had something thrown at them, or being hit so hard that they were injured or had a mark? That's one of the ten, well, I've got eleven here, ten or eleven questions that are always asked. Now, domestic abuse exposure is often the most prevalent of all the adverse childhood experiences. So if we can reduce child exposure, then we're going to reduce a lot of adversity. That's why it's really important for us to think about this topic. So what I did was I had a look at the literature, and there are tens of thousands of articles on this. So what I decided to do was look at the literature that review articles, so articles that are published where they have collected data on lots and lots, all the studies available, and then put them into one place. So I looked at about 20 review articles over the last decade. And these are just, uh, not all the figures, just a, a sort of an example. As you can see, but Generally, exposure to violence between parents, domestic violence, is pretty similar for boys and girls. Um, if there's any difference at all, it tends to be that girls see a bit more of it, and, which is interesting because boys and girls are equally in the home. But actually what we find is girls tend to be in the house more and boys tend to be outside a little bit more. So maybe girls are more aware of domestic abuse because they tend to be inside the family home on average more hours than boys are inside the family home. There may be other explanations, but that's the one I've seen in the literature. But generally, rates go from 50% of children down to about 8-10% of children. So quite a lot of variation. So peer-reviewed papers from 2009 to 18, 14 reviews of all the other research, and again, they came from all over the globe. Um, all of the studies I looked at had boys and girls in them. I didn't look at any studies that only looked at girls, or only looked at, but there, there are no studies that only look at boys, but there's quite a few that only look at girls. And I looked at when it was available, sex of violent parents, sex of child, and then tried to look at the outcome across the developmental time period. So EIPV is Exposure to Interparental Violence. I got bored of typing it, so I thought I'd make an acronym, make it easy. Um, and it is a robust cross-sectional, so where we ask people as an adult what happened to them and how they are now. That's a cross-sectional study. Longitudinal, where we've actually followed people from birth all the way through to 30, 40 years old. So that's really good, uh, very robust research. We find that it is a really good predictor of whether you're going to go on to be violent in your relationships. So for boys and girls, if you witness your parents using violence to each other, it is a very good predictor that you will also use violence when you grow up towards your partner. It increases the odds about four and a half times if you've been exposed. There is no significant difference whether you see your father hit your mother or your mother hit your father, the impact is the same. So it's not that, um, you know, mums may be hitting dads and dads hitting mums, but actually dads, dads' violence is so much scarier and more harmful. There's no evidence for that in the literature. There's no difference with a male child being exposed to a female child. It harms boys and girls in a very similar way. 
There's no significant interaction with the perpetrator sex or the child. So there's this idea that if boys see dad hitting mum, he'll be a perpetrator. And if girls see mum being hit, she'll be a victim. This is how it's always spoken about in the literature that I read, uh, building on social learning theory. But actually, the research doesn't say that. If girls see mum hitting dad, it's the same as if girls see dad hitting mum. Being exposed to violence is an adverse childhood experience. It's not about patriarchy. To the child, it is a, it is a um, distressing uh, occurrence, often a chronic one, which impacts on the whole developmental process of that child. Parental exposure is this risk factor for boys and girls to go on to have significant problems in their own lives. So... If you're exposed to partner violence growing up, you're more likely to be depressed as an adult. And your exposure, it doesn't matter if you're too young to actually vocalise it, even if it's pre-language. We know tiny infants are very sensitive to threat. And you can put, have these little studies we do at my university where you have a little camera on the baby's face. Uh, and when you show threatening stimuli to a small child, a baby, it will, it will stare at it for a long time. And the thing with ch very young children is they can't disengage. So where an older child will actually, if something's distressing, they will try and look away. Babies don't. They just watch. They just watch. So they have no way really of protecting themselves. They are completely exposed and unable to turn away from that threatening stimuli. And we see that again up to three, seven years old. There's still that tendency that the child can't. So we know young children exposed to violence are at this risk of having a heightened threat system. So if you look at neurocognitive models of uh, the impact of childhood trauma, you see that if you use brain imaging, you can actually see the impact on how the brain responds to threat as people grow up. So you will see that if somebody's been exposed to chronic aggression growing up through their pa uh, parents, you will see that that person actually seems to have a, a quite a high threat level. On rest in normal, a good day, you're quite hyper alert. So you're probably feeling quite stressed generally. And then if you're exposed to any uh, additional stresses, your uh, emotional experience is very fast and it's very hard. So that's what we see. We see children who cannot manage a really high arousing situation. So even sitting in a classroom for these children will be very difficult because they go in halfway up the scale already. So you haven't got a lot of flexibility. If you start getting a bit bored or don't understand the question, then you can find that these children cannot sit through even classrooms. So the impact isn't just emotional. It's cognitive, it is educational, and that spans out into uh, the employment market and to society in general. And once you get to children of 8 to 12 years, you can actually watch their physiological response. Their heart rate is higher, their skin conductance is more. They are physiologically impacted greatly because they've been exposed to this adverse childhood experience. So what does all these papers tell us? Well, we know children who are exposed to parent, parental violence between each other have more internalising, so they're more likely to be anxious, to be depressed, uh, to be self-harming, um, suicidal, and externalising behaviour. So they're more likely to be aggressive and disruptive and confrontational uh, as well. Now, there are some, there's mixed results. If you do find a difference between externalising and internalising, you will find that girls are more likely to internalise and boys are more likely to externalise. But essentially what you are seeing is symptoms, you are seeing behaviours that are symptomatic of distress. So whether you shout or whether you cry, it is still distress. The distress is authentic and it deserves to be recognised and uh, addressed. Um, yes, oh, I think we've pretty much done that. So there's no evidence that the sex of a parent is important gender-wise. So... No differences when you only look at the male partner's violence or both partners' violence. But there are no studies that only ask about mum's dad violence to dad's. There are quite a lot of studies that only ask about dad's violence to mum, including the World Health Organization. They 
deliberately do not ask their question about adverse child experiences, ask about mother being hit. Um, the only, I think there was one country, it might have been Turkey, Turkey uh, maybe, who actually said, no, we want both parents in there. So when we talk about excluding, not even recognising, it is a deliberate behaviour to take out dads from a question and not even ask about it. What we know as well is that there is a dose response. So the more adversity you experience, the more harmful, potentially, the impact of that. And we know children who are exposed to domestic violence, whether by mum, dad or both parents, have significant impairment potentially in their relationships with their friends. They find it hard to have close relationships. They end up with quite coercive relationships often. Um, they find it difficult to manage conflict in their own relationships and are more likely to use violence. They find it difficult to find partners who aren't similarly aggressive because non-aggressive partners often don't want to be partnered with somebody who's aggressive and uh, under controlled. And this is a clear pattern. This dose response, the more your exposure, the more the harm. So exposure to intimate partner violence is, is associated with adverse childhood experiences. It's the most common one, but it's also a really good predictor of additional exposure. So if you have IPV, partner violence between caregivers, the majority of children who have that will have another adverse childhood experience in there, be it neglect, or physical abuse and so forth. 74% of children exposed to domestic violence will also have two more adverse childhood experiences. And 64% will have three or more. And if you've got a dose response, you start seeing that each additional one creates additional risk. So there's some data from the UK. Um, we're quite interested in this. Uh, generally adverse childhood experiences uh, and we know that so this is one about sexual behaviour the graphs look very similar to uh, males and females look pretty much the same. As the number of adverse childhood experiences increase so does problematic sexual behaviour, so does uh, physical health complaints, so if you've got four ACEs you're far more likely to get cancer, strokes, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease digestive liver disease respiratory disease. Essentially, the more adversity you experience early in life, the quicker you will die. All things being equal. There are things we can do. We can, you know, there's groups and interventions we can help people manage this negative, dysregulated emotion, which seems to be the, the thing that drives this relationship. But it should at least make us think that it is important that we recognise the most common adverse childhood experience is exposure to domestic abuse. And it doesn't matter who's doing it, whether it's male or female. If we want to help children and society, we need to be really on this. The World Health Organisation tells us and reminds us that abuse and neglected children does cause acute emotional harm. So it should be stopped for that reason. But the long-term harm is a problem to the child, it's a problem for society, and it's a problem for the whole world because we live in the environment with these people. Uh, and we, we want to, we should help them for them, but we should help them for ourselves as well. So there are protective factors, such as um, giving children a sense of control, hope, self-esteem. Uh, helping them regulate their own emotional experiences. Children who are intelligent tend to fare a little better. Um, positive relationships, so if you're a teacher and you'd be that person that looks at that child and talks to them, that can be enough to give people that protective factor that they can exp experience this and grow up to have great relationships. But for those children that don't have these factors, it really does look quite dire. So the implications are it is a damaging thing being exposed, regardless of it, whether you're a boy or a girl, or mum or dad, or both using violence. It's the most common adverse childhood experience. Um, we should ask about fathers and mothers' uh, use of violence, otherwise we're not getting a full picture. Because there's no difference on the impact. These findings are inconsistent with the EU and the World Health Organization's focus on women and girls, continually focusing on women and girls. And it's inconsistent with a focus on men as perpetrators and a problem in society.
Thank you. Bueno, pues ahora vamos a tener la, la disertación de, de Marta Iglesias, eh, que nos va a, a hablar de, de la, la, la parte profunda que tiene todo esto. Adelante, Marta. Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me for the Human Series. It's really nice to be to be part of this initiative. So, before we delve deeper into the details of uh, female aggression, since I'm going to talk about the more general perspectives or evolutionary perspectives of the aggression, I would like to start with a more general discussion. I would like to start to talk about the tools and ways of thinking that we have available to us uh, to address our, our collective problems. So, okay. So when we pass laws and when we discuss, when we discuss um, societal problems, we, all, we usually have in mind the, issue, the issues that, that our citizens are facing. So we have in mind the problems that, uh, such as drug addiction, suicides, or various forms of crime, from vandalism to murder. And all these are specific problems that usually have spe specific uh, immediate triggers, and that's why they are, we, they are necessary, this, uh, uh, that's why they demand specific policies and and legislative solutions. But in another sense, our social problems are all um, specific manifestations of a more general human nature. These problematic behaviors are manifestations of uh, the principles that human, being, human beings use to solve their, their life's problems since time immemorial. So, for example, uh, crime partly arises because human beings have always fought over dominance using aggression. So we have this aggression as a tool to solve the problems uh, when we have to solve any conflict. And um, we always um, fought to exclude and to avoid being excluded. And like in another species, we have developed strategies to deal with defeat and to maximally um, exploit our victories. <coughs> so to understand and prevent crime maybe can be helpful to better understand the universal human desire to dominate. By analogy, it might be worth taking the time to um, examine human nature when solving other sociological problems as well. And the hope is that by better understanding this um, human nature of, and, and motivations that we have, uh, we can try to figure out how to, to try to control it, to modulate it, on, or maybe we can even try to channel it towards productive uh, behaviors rather than, rather than anti-productive anti or counterproductive behaviors. So my goal uh, today in this talk is going, I'm going to try to apply this more general framework to understand the problems of aggression among females. Um, and the, uh, in the talk I will first lay out some clear evidence that female aggression is a real phenomenon and it might be a contributor to many so uh, current social problems. Next, I will take a brief look of, into the biologi biological reasons behind uh, why female aggressions behave so aggressively. And I also will provide a bit of the analysis of, on the evolutionary triggers um, of aggressive behavior. And then maybe we can discuss a bit about uh, these more practical implications of the current research. So... When we talk about aggression, we, we often think about men for a good reason. So men are much more likely to murder, to rape, or to generally use physical violence in disputes. Most of our prisons are filled by men. 
But just because the male physical aggression is a greater problem in our society, it does not mean that female aggression is harmless or is non-existent. So, okay. so, what we know is that female aggression is less noticeable because it usually does not express itself in the, in the form of overt physical aggression. You know, when we talk... yes. ah. when we talk about um, other forms of, more specific forms of aggression like uh, intimate partner violence or uh, ag aggression between the families and with the kids, we, we see that women can use this physical aggression to deal with conflicts, but in general, um, women use more indirect means like bullying and reputation harming. And left unchecked, this indirect aggression it might create very real problems in society. So we we know the relationship. We know that is expressed in the form of social isolation or bullying, and well, just to give you an example, uh, it's recently been shown that the, um, I can't just, uh, the, the, you can see the recently rise in the um, dramatic self-harm uh, rates among teenagers. It's lately been linked with the, um, the, an increase also in bullying facilitated by the social media and, well, it is true that in these cases we do need more uh, studies, we need more information, but uh, we know that there are some problematic effects to this indirect aggression. We know how this affects the, the sociological, uh, psychological uh, status of the individual, but the most honest attitude is to say that we really need more research on female aggression because we don't know very well, or we don't know much about the relationships between important issues like bullying and self-harm, as I show you, or bullying and work performance. So many of you might still be skeptical about this female aggression. So I just want to give you uh, the following list uh, of examples that I divided in few categories uh, to give you a... Uh, big look out of it. So, this article shows that in the workplace, women report experiencing more incivility from other women, from other women than from men. This another study shows that females believe that other women um, are good managers, but in fact they don't want to work with them or work for them. Uh, this other study shows that women because women often see uh, highly qualified um, female candidates as a competitive threat and lower qualified female candidates as a collective threat, well, they don't want to work with them. They don't want to work uh, with these females as peers. Um, this study, is, it's a nice study that show that um, in the within the partner, uh, within the partners, it's uh, lesbian partners have uh, experienced more physical violence than heterosexual partners or heterosexual women experience in a heterosexual relationship. This is in the same study. We see that uh, more lesbian partners uh, than gay partners also have experienced more um, um, violence within the, within the couples. This one shows that some wars in the internet are going on in which one, one group of mothers is trying to brand the other group of mothers as, uh, as if they had bad parenting uh, ideas. This other study shows that um, female groups engaged in social ostracism more than, than male groups did. Um, 
in the studies, uh, it is uh, a book in which he shows that while 15% of mother-in-law, son-in-law relationships have some tension, 60% of mother-in-law, daughter-in-law bonds are described with some you know, negative stress and bad, in, bad um, relationship. Uh, another study shows that women reported that they will invest less in partners of the same sex than high status men in partners of the same sex. This other study shows that females reported more negative reactions than males when outperformed by, by the, their same sex par peers. This other study shows that females are more likely than, male, than males to respond to threats of social exclusion with more social exclusion. Another one shows that women reported their anger will dissipate less quickly and they will take longer to be friends again. This one is a really nice review in which you, they study uh, the behavior of kids and they show the girls are more often victims of social exclusion by their peers, as, well, as you see in the graphs, more than the kids, more about the boys. And in the same study, you can see also that the reasons why the girls are being bullied uh, are the physical attractiveness, so the more pretty they are, they get more bullied. Um, also the sexual activity, and you see that in men, in boys, it happened kind of the opposite. Uh, this one studies the, the reasons why they they engage in this indirect aggression and it's usually about self-promotion and talking about or spree, spreading rumors on uh, the question, the fidelity or the level of promiscuity of the rival of the other girl. This study shows that women damage rivals' reputation in private but they actually do not report in public just disliking them. And this is a really nice study because we have been seeing this for a long time. So I hope by now that you have been convinced that women do exhibit some kind of systematic aggressive tendencies. But you might still be asking why does it matter? Because it's not the case that I just, in most of these examples that I just talk about, what happened is like uh, things like bullying, name, calling, or just just being rat rude. So uh, for this, we have two answers. I mean, the question is, does this um, indirect aggression have any impact in the uh, aggregated level? So we have two answers to this. So. Many forms of female aggression do cross the line from unpleasant to the truly damaging, as we saw in the previous talks. Uh, but we shouldn't uh, ignore the damage uh, from, from indirect aggressions. So let's, let's take uh, the example of bullying. When females bully their subordinates or when they fail to support the hiring of uh, other females, well, they are indirectly undermining all these diversity initiatives that we want to you want to make to work we want to make to work when uh, the discussions uh, about modern practices uh, in the internet turn into flame wars when one side is trying to to brand the other side as an inferior well we lose the ability to jointly figure out uh, parenting practices, and I think we all know that this has been a big issue, issue lately. And more broadly, um, adolescent aggressive tendencies um, such as the inability of little schoolgirls to repair friendships or just have some friendly competition, well, it undermines the ability uh, of society to to cooperate. And this we know that have some long-term effects in how we do cooperate as adults. Well, we don't know the relationship, but we know the, 
the cooperation in novels, uh, it's kind of uh, different. So I probably just over overwhelmed both the audience and myself with uh, a long or specific examples of female, female aggression. But when you listen to these examples, I hope you notice some common themes, some the way that the female participates in aggression has a certain pattern to it. So let's just repeat a few more examples to highlight the pattern. Sorry, to highlight the pattern. Um, for example, why is mostly uh, fight with all the mother-in-laws and not father-in-laws or brothers uh, in the workplace, uh, main, uh, women mainly bully other women uh, rather than men, and even little school girls have you know, trouble getting along with other girls and not that, that it doesn't happen in boys. So cross-cultural meta-analysis, there are the important analysis here because they uh, summarize a wide variety of studies in which they include uh, results from different countries with different methodologies and, and different results. Well, they confirm, we, we, see, we can see the strength of this behavior and they confirm this trend that I've been showing you. So when women commit aggressive acts, they usually do so against other women and they usually uh, use also indirect, indirect forms of aggression uh, such as uh, reputation harming, slander and rumors uh, as their main tool. And this can be, well, this can be summarized in this graph in which you can, we can see the differences in the types of aggression that than men and women, and women use. And we can see that men use more physical and verbal aggression and women use more indirect aggression. This is a really nice meta-analysis. Um, and what we can also see is that the differences exist since early childhood. So we can observe that from, from six years old, we already observe differences in uh, how men and women or boys and girls perform uh, this aggression. And we can see there is more, uh, physical aggression is more used in male, in boys, and in verbal aggression too. And with the, this data given from the cell reports, we can think that maybe there is no difference in how women and men or boys and girls uh, compete or how they, they uh, attack each other. But this is because we are taking into account only the data of the cell reports. If we check the data from the peer reports, the data they give the teachers, the family, we can see that the, um, the aggression, the difference in aggression is high from the, from the early childhood and progressively increase with age, both in physical aggression and indirect aggression. And this, uh, also these differences peaks in the moment of optimal reproduction from the biological point of view. So it is now natural to wonder why. Why do we exhibit such patterns of aggression in particular? Why is female aggression uh, type so different from the typical male method? So to think about the answers, I, I want to go deeper into the biological explanations. But first, uh, let me give you a little, excuse me. Let me give you a little introduction uh, to the meaning of evolution. So biological explanations of the human nature originate from the fields of evolutionary game theory, evolutionary ecology, behavioral ecology, evolutionary biology. And evolution, as well as we all know, is the main theory that we use to explain why, being, why human beings, why animals, change over time. Just evolution can, uh, ex can be used to explain why a bat got 
its wings are why raptors have a very good sight vision. No, we can also use um, evolution, the, evolutionary, the evolutionary theory can be used to explain how animal behavior and human behavior uh, evolved over time. So evolutionary theory always asks what, what is the function of a particular uh, behavior that we are observing. So, and by function, what we mean is that how does this behavior in particular uh, support the ability to, uh, for an organism to survive and reproduce? And to reproduce because we all human beings, that we all animals have something in common, that is that we are offspring. So we are the result of individuals, individuals that were able to reproduce and who in turn were the progeny of in the other individuals that managed to do the same. And the ones that didn't uh, manage to reproduce, they didn't leave a copy of themselves, so they, don't, they do no longer exist. And accordingly, um, each uh, living being is potentially uh, reproductively effective because it, it is the offspring of some individuals that were also reproductively effective. So, but before uh, I continue, it's important to stress that um, an evolutionary perspective is not prescriptive. It does not imply that what has evolved is morally good. It's, it doesn't mean that if something was mm, useful in the past uh, for reproduction, is how things must continue. Rather, it's better understood uh, as a theory which explains uh, why human behavior is sometimes very stereotyped. So, because, you know, human behavior is quite malleable, and yet despite this flexibility, it often tends to, towards stereotype, stereotyping behaviors or patterns that we observe in the population all across the, the, the world. So with this, with this caveat in mind, um, let's just take a look about what evolutionary theory tells us about aggression. So, from the study of other mammalian species, we can see that human beings, we are not far, we, we are far from atypical. So, in most of other mammalian species, uh, the males are larger and they, they spend most of the time competing uh, or fighting by themselves. And the benefits of winning those fights are clear. So, the one who wins is the one that the female deem most attractive. So, it gets the chance to father most of the children. Um, in some species like uh, a deer, um, Few males dominate mostly all, all the territory and they get to father most of the children and the females come to them almost like voluntarily. But the case of the human species is not so extreme. So we have, um, our infants are really vulnerable and for really long periods of time. So they require quite a bit parental care. So women and men typically uh, pair up in small groups, family groups, um, to take care of the offspring. And th this means that no, not only men has to comp compete uh, amongst themselves to, to look attractive uh, for the females, but females also have to compete to get chosen by women, by men. And this explains much of the aggression that happens within the sex. So men fight uh, with other uh, men and women compete with other women to, to get chosen. So certainly our cultural dimension, dimension affects the way we reproduce, but we cannot modify that much this um, 
the, the mechanisms that are behind, because these mechanisms that we have evolved to choose a mate and to reproduce are a product of our biology that passed on along a lineage of successful breeders. So there is another interesting component that is that infant care, we have, we have seen in the studies that uh, is not only useful if it comes from the parents, but if it is also useful for, the, for kids if the help also comes from the other members of the group. So particularly if they come from other women. So this established a second line of conflict. Now this, not only com women compete um, amongst themselves for a suitable father for the offspring, but they also compete um, between themselves for the help of the group. And in addition to all the above ideas, well, we have more observations. So as we have been seeing, uh, female aggression uh, takes place without the use of direct means, as we saw. And this observation, it, it looks like also have an, evolution, an evol evolutionary explanation. So this greater use uh, of indirect regression is often attributed to the way that that the human reproduction works. So for women, their reproduction is, um, their reproduction su success depends very much on their ability to take care of the offspring, but also to, um, to um, gestate, to the fertility also, uh, it's a nice indicator of the, the success of a woman. So women have an incentive to try to avoid suffering physical risks as much as they can. Otherwise, they will put their fertility in risk. And this, this conflict, as we have seen, what well, it looks like is solved by the using of indirect means. But as, as we, all, we also saw in the previous talks, there are some moments in which uh, the female aggression goes from indirect to more direct forms of aggression. And this is because aggression is a behavior that is really context dependent. So as we saw in the partner violence and in the violence towards kids, there are so many cases in which we, if we analyze the context, we can see how it uh, develops. So for example, if we uh, have um, if, if the resources are scarce, we also see the females use more direct aggression. And if the relationship within, so the ratio of female to male, males are really high and the competition increases, we also observe in the, in the population that the aggression, the physical aggression with females also increases. So, um, Well, see ya. And, yeah, yeah. Actually, finish? Well, you, you, you can go finishing. Okay. I just wanted to point it out that even though we observe this uh, physical, more physical aggression in some specific moments, uh, evolution in general has avoided uh, direct confrontation among women. Um, this is uh, the best understanding that we have about uh, how evolution can affect the way we show aggression in today's world. And I have more information about the um, uh, more uh, the, the, the influence of hormones and the influence the gen of the genetic component. Uh, but if we don't have time, I think... 25 minutes, I think. She, she has time? Yeah. How much? Yes? Okay, okay. Ah, okay. So, well, we are just going about to conclude. So, there is this one more component of biology that is uh, of interest when we want to understand how aggression unfolds. That is that the evolutionary analysis 
emphasize the um, certainly uh, heavily certain strategic like, factors like, like uh, taking care of the children or competing for mates. But um, though these considerations are strategic, they are not necessarily implemented through, through a strategic plan, planning. In fact, most of this impulses seems to remain unconscious, subconscious within us, and they are implemented uh, through a wide variety of um, subconscious mechanisms, such as the action of hormones and deep brain circuits. Uh, so hormones certainly have an influence on how likely we are to commit aggression. Uh, the aggressive tendencies during poverty, you know, uh, increases or peaks uh, with, uh, in, with, when we have more hormonal sec, uh, hormones in the bodies of boys and girls. And um, also, in addition to hormones, we have uh, also a genetic component to consider. And the meta-analysis of irritability study shows that uh, almost, I, I pointed it in red, almost 40% of the inter-individual variation in our antisocial and aggressive behaviors are um, explained by the genetical component. And, well, I just want to give you with some conclu conclusions of the latest research. Uh, the, it's uh, women engaged in several forms of aggressive behavior. The primary type seems to be reputation harming, which is directed mainly to other women. And this behavior changed how to cooperate in groups, and in extreme cases it can lead to, to ostracism. The female tendencies uh, towards um, indirect aggression, uh, same sex uh, aggression seems to be explained by a revolutionary need to compete for the best mate and for the best social support, but while at the same time avoiding lasting uh, physical damage to our bodies. And about 40% of the variation between tendencies towards aggressive behavior is modulated by genes. And during our lifetime, these genetic influences are implemented through the wiring of our brain at the level of hormones in our bodies. And of course, we need more research in how non-physical aggression has a real impact on society. Thank you. Bueno, pues muchas gracias Marta por poner en el paisaje los temas que estamos hablando hoy sobre los diferentes tipos de agresión masculina y femenina.